Hello everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar. We're excited to be celebrating Bird Health Awareness Week. This is part of USDA's Defend the Flock campaign, promoting awareness about the importance of biosecurity and ways to prevent the spread of infectious poultry diseases. We're here today to support you and your flocks with expanded biosecurity resources. Whether you're just starting out raising poultry or you have years of experience, practicing good biosecurity is the best way to keep flocks disease-free. I'm Dr. Julie Gauthier with the USDA, and today I'm joined by Dr. Tassine Aziz and Dr. Michael Martin from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Before we get started, we want to let you know that closed captions are available for this program. For anyone who wishes to view real-time streaming captions, type the caption URL that you see on this screen, bit.ly slash feb27-webinar into your browser. The URL appears at the bottom of every slide, so you can link to captions at any time during the program. Please note that the URL is case sensitive. Now we'll take a few minutes to introduce ourselves. I'm Julie Gauthier, and I am the Assistant Director for Poultry Health, working for USDA APHIS. I'm a veterinarian, and I keep a small flock of poultry at home. Dr. Aziz, please tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm Tassin Aziz. Uh, I'm a veterinary pathologist and diagnostician at Rollins Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory, North Carolina Department, uh, North Carolina Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory System, North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Thank you, Dr. Aziz. Dr. Martin, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi all, I'm Mike Martin. I'm the Director of Poultry Programs for the Veterinary Division at the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Please feel free to submit your questions by clicking the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. APHIS and our guests will answer all your questions after the webinar has concluded. The Q&A will be posted along with the recording of this webinar on the APHIS website. Be sure to follow the Defend the Flock campaign on Facebook and Twitter to find out when the Q&A and the recording are available. We'll share those online destinations at the end of the webinar. We'll start off our presentation by talking about why prevention is so important and usually much more successful than treatment, like the injection this sick hen is receiving. Preventable infectious diseases cause much suffering for poultry, not just in the United States, but all over the world. Flock keepers frequently contact me asking for treatment for their sick chickens, and too often my answer is heartbreaking for both me and the owner, because I know that no treatment exists that will cure the problem, or it's too stressful for very sick chickens to undergo treatment, or many flock keepers will tell me that medicating poultry is too costly for them. I wish we could have had a different conversation earlier before they started keeping poultry about how to prevent the problem through biosecurity. Mike, I know that you've also had this conversation with people faced with sick flocks. Could you talk more about the difficulties in treating sick poultry and why prevention is more effective? Sure, Julie. Um, we, we're going to talk a lot during this presentation about various diseases. Some are more common than others. And what you'll see during some of these discussions is that there are a fair number of these diseases that have no treatment associated with it, which means that these birds are not only going to get sick from a disease if they get exposed, and they may suffer during the time when you're trying to figure out what to do with them, but then there may not be a treatment available, or if the treatment is available, it may be too late to treat them effectively, or it may not be very cost effective. So realistically, when we're looking at this type of situation, prevention is key. To prevent these diseases from happening at all really just mitigates everything so you hopefully don't have to go down the treatment path. Any step you take to sp stop the spread or introduction of harmful germs to your flock is biosecurity. A biosecurity plan is a combination of steps that you've chosen for your flock. Every flock's unique. So biosecurity for each flock is unique and customizable for your property, for the reason that you keep your birds, for your climate, and other things that make your flock special. For biosecurity to be successful, it should be good habits that are easy for you to do every day, every time. It should be practical, affordable, and focus on the big risks, such as bringing new birds home. 
When I talk to other small flock owners, they ask me why they need to buy a security plan if they only have a few chickens. I tell them that uh, with a few inexpensive and simple habits, they can have a lot of control over the risks to their flock's health. Mike, what advice do you give to small flock keepers about the importance of practicing biosecurity? Well, as we were talking about where prevention is better than treatment, if you're going to be doing disease prevention with your flock, then the way to start is having a plan for biosecurity or a physical plan itself, like either written or in your head, as far as how you're going to control and mitigate against risks of disease. For every flock, you're going to have a bit of individuality. Each flock is different. The environment is different. And it's up to you to kind of determine for your flock what is the most common and most likely risk factors for bringing bag bugs into your population. After that, then it is going and looking at what ways you might use to prevent those disease organisms from getting into your flock and determining what's going to be effective for you, what's going to be cost effective, what's going to be time effective, and then just determining how you're going to go about it and being consistent every time as far as practicing good biosecurity. So it's, it's individualistic plan, and but planning nonetheless. In the next part of our presentation, my guests and I will talk about poultry problems that biosecurity can prevent. We have grouped those diseases into three major categories. First, there are the rare but highly contagious and very deadly poultry diseases. Next are very common and preventable poultry diseases in the United States. And we'll also talk about germs that don't usually make poultry sick, but could be dangerous to people who become infected. Without biosecurity, the diseases that we'll show you next are more likely to happen. By practicing biosecurity every day, every time, you may never see the problems that we're about to describe. To know whether a disease is affecting your flock, you've got to know how to spot a sick chicken. We'll help you identify a sick bird so that you can do something about it. Tustin, what are the warning signs that chickens are sick? Well, first, you should know the normal behavior and appearance of the birds in your flock. Healthy birds should be alert, active, have normal appearance and posture, and should walk normally. The most common symptoms in sick birds include uh, decreased activity, lethargy, uh, not eating, anorexic, the bird is anorexic, limping, uh, leg weakness, abnormal posture, uh, loose or bloody dropping, paleness, discoloration, or swelling of the comb and wattle and face, a swelling of the eyelids, difficulty breathing, rasping breathing, ocular and nasal secretions, watery eyes, uh, swelling of the feet and joints, a severe feather loss, uh, distension of the abdomen, uh, and thick thickening of the skin of the lower legs. All these are really uh, symptoms indicate that sickness in, in the birds. So the young chicken on the left and the baby turkey on the right, they don't look to me like they're feeling very well. Tassin, could you describe in detail the signs of illness that these birds are showing? And Julie, you are right. Certainly these two birds, they don't look healthy. Uh, they look lethargic and they are crouching, which means they are in a hunchback posture. And the bird, especially on the right, which is a turkey, uh, looks listless, uh, has ruffled feathers, and the droopy wings, and the eyes are closed. So definitely these two birds uh, are not healthy. Sometimes poultry can act strangely or have an unusual appearance, but they aren't sick. Mike, what's going on with the hen in the box on the left and the odd-looking chicken on the right? So the bird on the left is actually exhibiting normal behavior for this chicken. It's a broody hen. Basically, this is a chicken becoming a good mom. It's sitting on some eggs, incubating those eggs, keeping them nice and warm and safe. Now, people might look at this and say this bird is inactive, it's not getting to feed and water as much as it used to and think that it's sick, but this is a very normal uh, uh, thing for these birds to do. The one thing to watch out for is some of these broody hens can become a little bit too maternal they may not get off and get enough food or water for themselves. 
So it's always good to kind of keep an eye on them, and, and if need be, you can kick them off their nest every once in a while so that that way they can get some food and water. Now the bird on the right is a silky chicken. It's part of the Asiatic class of poultry, and you can see its skin has a, a, a normal pigmentation that's darker. And people who don't realize that this is something specific to this breed would might think that there's some sort of skin disease or there's something wrong with it that needs to be uh, seen by a veterinarian, and that is just definitely not the case. And one of the things that Tatsin talked about is, again, knowing what's normal to determine abnormal. Well, look at the rest of the behavior of this bird. It's upright, it's alert, it's responsive, and so a lot of that goes to helping you determine that this bird is actually a normal bird. Now we'll get into details about some of the chicken diseases that we hope you never encounter because these can be devastating to backyard flocks. These pre preventable diseases can be grouped into four syndromes. These are infections that can cause sudden death of most of the flock, infections that cause a respiratory illness um, and affect the mouth, the nose, or the airways, infections that cause nervous system signs like Merrick's disease, and infections that affect the gastrointestinal tract like coccidiosis. In the first category of chicken diseases, uh, these are the ones that cause sudden death of many birds in a flock. These two diseases stand out, avian influenza and virulent Newcastle disease. You might see these diseases abbreviated as AI and VND. USDA veterinarians like me work hard to keep these two diseases out of the United States because they not only cause birds suffering and death, but outbreaks of these diseases can have a terrible impact on the economy and jobs related to the poultry industry, and also on the prices that we all pay for eggs and other poultry products. If a number of birds die suddenly in a flock without explanation, this could be a sign of one of these two diseases, and the flock keeper should notify animal health officials right away so that we can respond quickly to diagnose the problem and take measures to stop the spread of the disease. If you see birds die suddenly, you can contact your veterinarian or the USDA area veterinarian in charge or the state vet where you live. Justine, what is avian influenza and how is it spread? Well, avian influenza is a highly contagious, uh, highly transmissible disease uh, caused by a virus. Uh, the virus that uh, causes this disease can infect different kinds of birds, and the virus is shed in the respiratory secretions and the droppings of uh, infected birds. People can separate the virus on hands, shoes, clothes, and equipment, and also keep in mind that wild birds can also be an important source of infection. Now, the symptoms of avian influenza really vary and depends on, on the virus strain and on the host species, which means what kind of bird. Some strains produce mild respiratory symptoms, such as coughing, ocular and nasal secretions, uh, swelling of the nasal sinuses. Uh, swelling of the nasal sinuses is a really common sign in, in certain birds, such as duck, quail, and turkey. Now, on the other hand, some strains are very virulent, and these strains can cause a very high mortality that can reach 100% in a few days. In some cases of this virulent strains, chickens may die without showing symptoms. You don't see anything really, the bird just found dead. In other cases, the symptoms include blue discoloration and the swelling of the head, comb and wattle, red discoloration of the shank, which is the lower feet, uh, and lower leg and feet. In some cases, blood stained, ocular and nasal secretions, and the greenish diarrhea. So on the next slide, we show those signs that infected birds can, can show. And could you talk to us about treating these birds? Well, uh, avian influenza is really a not a uh, curable disease. There is no treatment like other viral diseases in poultry, so there is no treatment for uh, avian influenza. Now, uh, virulent Newcastle disease on the next slide is very similar to avian influenza, isn't it? 
Actually, it is. Uh, Newcastle disease infection with the Newcastle disease virulent strains can really be very similar, the sign to uh, avian influenza. And like influenza virus, the virus can spread uh, from infected birds through droppings and secretions from the body and on feathers. And again, people can move these uh, germs on the hands, shoes, clothes, and equipment. Could you describe the signs of infection with burial and Newcastle disease virus? Could it, could it be treated? Uh, the, as again, Newcastle disease is not treatable, and the symptoms vary depending on the virus strains. Some strains cause mild respiratory disease with mild respiratory symptoms. Other strains are very virulent and can cause high mortality that can reach 100%. Symptoms include uh, severe lethargy, decreased feed consumption and water intake, sneezing, nasal secretions, coughing, uh, gasping for air. Uh, other symptoms, greenish watery diarrhea, and sometimes we see swelling around the eyes and in the neck. These two diseases are, are just awful to birds, aren't they? On the next slide, we've got um, the signs listed there, and we've got three pictures on this slide that show a rooster and a hen that are affected by virulent Newcastle disease. Could you describe what you see in these photos? Certainly. The, the picture on the left uh, shows two birds. Uh, they are definitely depressed, lethargic. The picture in the middle, you can see the discoloration of the comb, and the picture on the right, you can see the secretions, discharge with me, and discharge from the nostrils and the mouth. Now we'll focus on more common diseases. These are often found in backyard flocks in the United States, and they are preventable with good biosecurity. These include respiratory diseases, Merrick's disease, and coccidiosis. These aren't the only contagious diseases affecting chickens, but they are the ones that flock keepers are most likely to see. The common respiratory diseases in chickens are caused by both bacteria and viruses. Mycoplasma infections are very common. The bacteria are named Mycoplasma gala septicum and Mycoplasma synoviae. You'll often see the names of these two bacteria abbreviated as MG and MS. Infectious coryza is another chicken respiratory illness caused by bacteria. Viruses cause the disease called infectious laryngotracheitis, abbreviated as ILT or LT, and infectious bronchitis, abbreviated as IB. All of these respiratory diseases can be spread by infected birds, including wild birds, and through their, their droppings, through any body discharges, and feathers. Again, people can move the germs around on their hands, their shoes, their clothes, or dirty equipment. And in the case of MG, the hen can spread it to her chick through the egg. Tassine, what are the signs that a flock is affected by one of these respiratory diseases, and what can be done about it? Well, the signs of respiratory disease are really not specific. They are, they are general, and usually they don't pinpoint to a certain disease. Uh, the most common symptoms in birds affected with respiratory disease include rasping breathing, such as gurgling respiration, uh, secretions from the nostrils and eyes, which we call them ocular and nasal discharge, uh, swelling of the face due to infection of the nasal sinus, as well as swelling of the eyelids, uh, gasping for air. The bird ha has difficulty breathing, and you notice the bird open the mouth uh, during breathing. Uh, drop in egg production, sometimes with change in egg quality, such as production of misshapen eggs, uh, eggs with thin shell, and sometimes eggs without shell. Uh, keep in mind, again, that these symptoms uh, are general and not specific for all it can tell us is that the bird is affected with respiratory disease. 
Now, as far as the treatment, it depends on the causative agent. Uh, with viral diseases, uh, there is no treatment like other viral diseases in poultry. There is no treatment for viral disease. For bacterial diseases such as mycoplasma and other bacteria, uh, these diseases can be treated with antibiotic. However, keep in mind that although these antibiotics may cure the disease, the birds look fine, uh, does not show symptoms anymore, but these birds can remain carrier, the microorganism remain in the, in the body, and the bird can continuously or intermittently shed the causative agent and can be a source of infection to other birds in the flock. The next four slides show cases of each of those respiratory diseases. Tassine, please describe the signs of respiratory infection that you see in each of the photos. Uh, this is a turkey, and you can see there is swelling of the face under the eye, and the reason for this swelling is infection of the nasal sinus. And in this case, this bird is infected with mycoplasma. Next. Uh, the other slide shows the same thing. You can see the swelling in the face just under the eye, and this indicates infection of the nasal sinus of this bird, and in this case, the disease is infectious coryza caused by a bacteria. Next. Now, this bird, you notice stretching of the neck and opening of the mouth. These symptoms indicate that uh, the bird has difficulty breathing, really, and that's why the bird should stretch the head and open the mouth, trying to get air. And in this case, the disease is infectious laryngotracheitis, abbreviated ILT, and it is a viral disease. Now, this slide shows eggs, and these eggs are misshapen. They are not normal in shape. And as you can see, one of the eggs, uh, the egg shell is cracked, broken. And the reason for this is because the shell is, is just thin and can be broken easily. In this case, this, these eggs are from bird infected with infectious bronchitis virus, which is a viral disease, and the production, production of misshaping eggs, thin shell eggs, uh, eggs without shell, are symptoms of infection with this virus. A disease that unfortunately is very common in backyard poultry is Merrick's disease. Chickens can be infected with this virus early in life and not show any signs of disease until they're older. They've usually been part of the family flock for months to years before anyone realizes there's a problem. This virus is spread in the feather dust of infected chickens, and it can last in the environment for many months. People can also carry the virus around on their hands, their clothes, and their shoes, unless they clean up well after handling infected birds. Tassim, what does this virus do to birds, and can it be cured? Well, Merrick's disease is really very common in backyard chickens, and uh, as Julie mentioned, uh, it is mainly a disease of chicken, and the uh, infected chicken shed the virus in, in the dander and can transmit the virus to other birds in the flock. So it's really highly contagious disease. Uh, we have to keep in mind that there are different forms of this disease, but uh, two forms are common. One form is characterized by uh, the presence of tumors, which are called lymphoma, like cancer, and visceral organs. Uh, and the other form is characterized by damage to the nervous tissues in the body, uh, including nerves, brain, and the spinal cord. Now, there are other forms. One form is what we call it the eye form or ocular form, which is characterized by discoloration of the eye. is really not very common. Now, as far as symptoms, uh, chickens with advanced visceral tumors or cancer, become lethargic, lose weight, and they die. Now, the other form, which we call it the neural form, which affects the nerves and sometimes the brain and the spinal cord, is really very common in backyard chicken. The symptoms 
in this form, start with the bird. The first thing you notice, limping, wobbling when walking, sometimes with a droopy wing. Then gradually, these symptoms progress uh, to inability to stand, and the bird become very par uh, become paralyzed. Now, a classic posture is one leg stretched forward and the other leg stretched backward. But keep in mind that this is really not always the case. This, this posture has been described, and you can see a big picture of this posture in textbooks, but really you, cannot, you don't always see this. Most often the bird is totally paralyzed, laying on side or in external recumbency and cannot stand. Uh, other symptoms that we occasionally see is the twisting uh, of the neck, uh, but again, this is we, uh, occasionally and not always the case. And how can this be treated? Uh, medic disease, there's no treatment uh, because it's a viral disease. Like other viral diseases in poultry, there's no treatment for medic disease. Bad one. Um, Mike, you don't usually recommend vaccines for backyard birds, except for Merrick's disease, correct? Yeah, that is correct. Most of the vaccines out there for, for poultry, uh, for a lot of the d diseases that we talked about previously, are, are not really necessary in backyard birds, unless you have something like a specific history in that flock that would say that maybe you should vaccinate, and or if you have some other specific environmental factor that is saying, yeah, maybe I should vaccinate. But with Merrick's vaccine, this is one that all backyard birds should get if possible. Um, it is a bit challenging, though, in order to get a good effective vaccination for Merrick's. The best type of vaccine for Merrick's uh, requires a very specific storage. It has to be stored in liquid nitrogen. And so as such, most people who are hatching out small groups of birds, uh, it really is not uh, able to logistically or cost effective to get this vaccine. There are vaccines that can be stored at room temperature. They're not the best vaccines by far, but they are definitely better than doing nothing. Now, with the vaccine, it also is logistically challenging. You have to get the vaccine in the birds within 24 hours after the birds hatch. And any later than that, that really that vaccine is most likely not doing any good whatsoever. And so if you're trying to vaccinate all the birds in one clutch and you're trying to work with this vaccine that after you mix it, it's only good for a couple of hours, it's sometimes best to work with a veterinarian in order to guarantee the best results, best coverage for this vaccination. And along those lines, you know, a lot of the things that we've been talking about it really would be beneficial to have a very good relationship with your veterinarian that's going to work with your poultry flock. You talk about your biosecurity plan, the veterinarians can be very helpful helping you build that plan that's right for you. We talk about how do you recognize if disease is getting in your flocks. Well, that's what veterinarians are trained to do is recognize disease. We talked about a lot of these diseases looking very similar to each other. So veterinarians can help you build a diagnostic plan to help you determine what disease your bird has. And then beyond that, do you want to treat, do you not want to treat, what are you going to use? That's again a key factor that veterinarians can help you with. And if you try to treat yourself and you do not know what your birds have, you can often do more harm than good by giving them the wrong medication or you can develop disease resistant uh, bugs in, the, in your environment. So again, a good, strong veterinary relationship is really critical if you're owning backyard birds. The one other thing that I would just add with Merrick's disease is if you are looking online and you're trying to research up on Merrick's disease, there might be online sites that talk about this disease being in birds from about four to 16 weeks of age. With backyard birds, that is definitely not the case. There are many, many cases of Merrick's disease in backyard chickens for six months, a year, more than a year. So just don't be fooled by that if you see it. Next, we'll talk about coccidiosis, which is another extremely common disease of backyard poultry. It's caused by a parasite that lives in the intestinal tract. Coccidiosis is spread through the droppings of infected birds. And those droppings containing the parasites can easily contaminate equipment like transport cages. And people can easily become contaminated on their hands and their clothes and shoes. 
And then we can carry the parasite from place to place without knowing it. Kathleen, how would a flux caretaker know that birds have coccidiosis and what should they do? We've got our next slide that will um, help you talk about that. Well, let me say something about coccidiosis first. Uh, coccidiosis is uh, a disease of the intestinal tract caused by a parasite. Now, there are different kinds of this parasite that impact different areas of the intestinal tract. And as Julie mentioned, infected birds shed the egg of the parasite in the droppings, and other birds become infected by ingesting eggs from the environment. I must say one thing, that the eggs of the parasite need damp areas to develop and to become infective to other birds in the flock. So wet areas, for example, around the drinkers, are really a paradise for this parasite because as I said, the, the eggs of this parasite need to develop and they need damp areas to become infective to other birds. Now, as far as symptoms, uh, these symptoms are not specific and depend on the kind of the parasite, which part of the intestine is affected, and also on the severity of infections. With mild cases, you may, you may not see much but in severe infection, symptoms include weight loss, lethargy, anorexia, uh, watery and bloody droppings. Uh, and severe infection with certain kinds of this parasite can cause really heavy death loss in the flock. So coccidiosis should not be underestimated. This is a disease that really can cause heavy death loss uh, in the flock. Uh, I need to mention that this disease really is preventable and treatable. Uh, the disease can be uh, prevented. There are certain medications that can be prevent this disease, and there are also medications that can treat this disease. Veterinarian can prescribe these medications uh, for your flock. Uh, and again, I must emphasize that keeping the floor dry, especially around the drinkers, is really uh, an extreme, extremely important measure that you can take to uh, minimize the spread of the infection in your flock. Now we'll change the topic and talk about protecting human health through flock biosecurity. Fortunately, people and poultry don't share many diseases, but there are a few infections that people can get from having close contact with live poultry. We've been talking about germs that make poultry sick, but salmonellosis can be transmitted from healthy-looking poultry to people. Because salmonellosis is an important illness for people who keep poultry, we'll go into detail about that disease and how to prevent it. Worth mentioning, although much less common than salmonellosis, are psittacosis and avian influenza. Psittacosis is a lung infection that is transmitted from birds to people who have close contact with them. Outside of the United States, certain strains of avian influenza have been transmitted from birds to people. Kathleen, tell us about salmonellosis. What causes it and how is it spread? Well, salmonellosis is uh, a bacterial disease uh, caused by a bacterium called salmonella. And this bacterium really uh, it's common, wild birds can be infected, other farm animals, uh, rodents, all of these are really important source of infection uh, or your, of your flocks or with salmonellosis. One thing you have to keep in mind that in backyard poultry infected with salmonella, the infection is usually silent, which means that the birds carry the, the salmonella in the intestine, but they don't show symptoms. But this bird shed the bacterium in the droppings and can be a source of infection to humans. Now, contamination of hands from handling infected birds or from working in poultry premises can transmit the infection, the infection to humans. 
because as I said, the bird can carry the salmonella. You don't notice any symptoms on these birds, but they shed the bacterium in the droppings. And when you handle these birds or when you work in the premises, the, uh, you may carry this uh, bacterium and can cause infection. Children, elderly people, uh, per people with weak immune system are, are really particularly susceptible to illness from salmonella. So we need to be careful. Uh, as far as the prevention, uh, one single step you can take really wash your hands after handling birds and after working in the premises of backyard chickens. Uh, we tell people there's one thing you can do to prevent salmonella. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Thanks. And on the next slide, I think we have a, a display that people can have very mild cases or very severe cases of diarrhea. Yes, actually, in human beings, uh, the disease can be serious, uh, especially in young people and children and people with weak immune system, as I said, uh, and in elderly people, really. So it's very important to be careful when you handle birds. On when you work in the, uh, with these backyard chicken, it's extremely important that you wash your hands with soap and warm water to prevent uh, infection. And it, it seems really difficult to keep uh, kids from uh, picking up those cute baby chicks and trying to kiss them, but it's really important yes. that we make sure that we wash up after we handle birds and, and don't snuggle with them too closely. On uh, the next slide, we talk about an outbreak of salmonellosis that has occurred uh, associated with pet poultry in the United States. Mike, could you describe those recent outbreaks? Right, so um, just sort of like what Julie and Tassine have been talking about, you take these pieces of this puzzle and you put them together and that's what creates an outbreak. We get a situation where we have a common source of birds that may have been exposed to salmonella at a very young age. They carry the salmonella without showing any clinical signs. They're basically little typhoid Mary birds. And then the next thing you know, you've got people that may be having not as good of an immune system, very young, elderly people handling them, maybe not washing their hands properly. And then you can end up something that looks like this. And this is a map from the CDC, Centers of Disease Control, that shows the most recent outbreak in 2019. And you can just look at the number of cases in, the, in each of the states that has occurred. And so this is a very, very large outbreak. And as a matter of fact, if you look on the next slide, you can see that according to the Centers of Disease Control, this was the largest number of people in a given year to become sick from salmonella that came into contact with backyard poultry. And this is important because, you know, year after year we try to get information out how to prevent disease, how to prevent, you know, getting sick from these birds that silently carry salmonella, and yet year after year we end up with a large number of cases, and in this case the largest number we've ever had in the last year. So it's very important to remain very vigilant and just be very, very aware and conscientious that these healthy birds can carry diseases that will make you sick. We've just covered many ways that things can go wrong for a flock, but all of those diseases can be prevented through biosecurity and managing a flock well by keeping birds comfortable. In the next part of the presentation, we'll provide tips on simple biosecurity measures that anyone can use keep birds healthy. Biosecurity is a collection of good habits that you follow every day, every time you take care of your flock. It's not possible to completely eliminate all of the risks to a backyard flock, but you could significantly reduce the major risks and sources of germs. To be successful and practical, biosecurity habits should focus on the big risks for introducing disease. Mike, what are those big risks, and what are the steps that small flock keepers can use to protect their flocks? We can move to the yeah. next slide to show those. So, yeah, Julie, here's, here's a listing of some of the most common uh, risk things that we would take into consideration. Introduction of new birds into an existing flock is, is a big risk. Uh, wild birds that your birds could come into contact presents a risk. Just basic cleaning and disinfection, if things get really uh, dirty in your environment, that can be a risk factor. Visitors that own poultry themselves can be a problem. Rodents and insects can be problematic as well, as well as a stressful environment. And so for each of these bullet points, we're going to take a little time and talk about each of them in a little bit more depth. 
So on the next slide, we're talking about new poultry coming into your environment uh, into contact with your existing poultry flock. First of all, if you don't have to do this, just don't bring new birds into an existing flock. This is probably the number one reason that I see disease breaks that occur in backyard poultry is somebody bringing in birds that they think are healthy to their new birds or existing birds and then all of a sudden everybody gets sick. Um, so if you are going to be doing it, then I would use sources for birds that you have at least some information, knowledge about as far as their disease status. Flocks that participate in the National Poultry Improvement Plan or NPIP could be a potentially good source because at least we have some disease information that is coming from them. Some of the worst places to get birds from are things like auctions, swaps, county and state fairs, areas where you have a lot of birds from a lot of different environments that are unknown, all coming together, potentially sharing diseases, and then you grab some of these birds and bring them back to your house and they contaminate your, your existing flock. Now, if you are bringing birds in, to an existing flock, I highly recommend that you use a quarantine procedure for these birds. And this doesn't mean just separating the two groups of birds by some chicken wire. This means actually a physical separation where your old birds are in one area of your property and the new birds are in a completely separate area. This quarantine should be without any medications uh, going into the new birds. And then also you want to have at least the separation for at least 30 days uh, period of time. And you're basically during this time just checking and making sure that your new birds are not showing any clinical signs after being stressed with being put into a new environment. On the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about wild birds. And with wild birds, if you set up an environment where your poultry are kept that wild birds are going to naturally go to, that can be problematic. So setting up your pen or your coop away from ponds where wild waterfowl might be coming in can be very helpful. Also, wild birds are going to be attracted to easy feed and water sources. So if you have spilled feed in your environment, that's going to attract water, uh, wild birds as well. So just keeping things clean, covered up, and hopefully only accessible to your poultry. People can use decoys, scarecrows, those types of devices to keep wild birds away. I will say that wild birds pretty quickly figure out things if you don't move it around or change it up a bit. So I recommend that every day or two you're moving your scarecrow around, changing the clothing on it, putting a hat on, that type of thing. And even if it's just a, a, a fake owl, just moving it around from here to there will help keep those birds uh, detracted away. On the next slide, we talk a little bit about cleaning and disinfection. And so some of this is just basic day-to-day -day cleaning out things, keeping it all nice and sanitary. And remember, if you're using disinfectant, your disinfectant typically is not going to work with organic material. So anything like poop and feathers and stuff really need to be cleaned up before you put your disinfectant on. Looking at these waters here, you can see that the waters is green. Water should never be green. So this is a, pure, a sure sign that these waters need to be cleaned more frequently. But even your equipment, your clothing, especially if you've got birds in quarantine and you're going back and forth, you definitely want to clean and disinfect all these things in between uh, growing from between groups of birds and keep your hands washed on a, on a regular basis. On the next slide, we'll talk about visitors. Now, People who own backyard poultry oftentimes like to relate to other people who own backyard poultry. And a lot of times we like to share our coop design and how pretty our birds look. But this can definitely be risky as in your friend might have a disease in those birds that you could accidentally or they could accidentally bring to your birds or vice versa. You may have a disease you're not aware of that you could bring to your friend's birds, which are not very neighborly thing to do. So if you can avoid visitors, that's probably the best thing. But if you are going to have visitors, make sure they have a really good idea of biosecurity. They should have clean clothes, clean shoes, washing their hands, and shower in between going back and forth between the two flocks would be a good idea as well. On the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about rodents and insects. Uh, first of all, a lot of the things we talked about with uh, wild birds, it's the same type of stuff here with some rodent activity and insects. It's keeping things clean, keeping things like easy feeding and watering areas for rodents is a good idea. 
uh, you know, to mitigate against these rodents wanting to come here. You want to get rid of hidey spots, tall grass and clutter rodents will like to go to, make nests in and hide out with. So if you keep a nice, clean and tidy environment around your poultry coop, that's going to go a long way as far as preventing from rodents and insects from coming along. Now, if you do have rodent and insect problems, you can definitely use traps and bait stations, but they must be maintained properly. You can't just put a bait station out and expect it's going to do all the work for you. This bait station does not have any bait at all. That's not going to do anybody any good. And as a matter of fact, it's just filled with debris and, and stuff that is not helpful and can actually be bedding material for rodents. And I've actually opened up a bait station before and found a mouse, uh, basically a whole family of baby mice living in the bait station. That is not a well-maintained bait station. That's doing more harm than good. It's just be smart, maintain them properly, and, and that'll go a long ways. And with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass the torch back over to Julie. Thank you, Mike. Those are tips that anybody can use to protect their flock. I'd also like to share some of the steps that I use to prevent spread of disease, not only introducing germs to my flock, but also spreading disease within the flock. Uh, I also recommend a quarantine for new birds, and I use the 30-30 rule. Uh, keep those quarantine birds 30 feet away from any other bird, at least, um, and for 30 days, at least. Um, many uh, backyard flocks have not only chickens, but other types of poultry, too. And they're often birds of different ages, ranging from baby poultry to adult birds. It's a good idea to keep your types and ages of poultry separate, such as separated pens for chickens and ducks. And it's also a good idea to keep the baby separated from the adults. This is particularly important for preventing Merrick's disease from spreading in a flock of chickens. I start my tour route each day from the youngest to the oldest birds, starting with the babies and the brooder, and then working to the adult birds. Finally, I leave those quarantine birds alone uh, until last, and I also take care of any sick birds after everyone else, so I don't track disease throughout the flock. After I'm done with the chore route for the day, I won't go back to the flock until I've showered and put on a clean set of clothes. Life security is also good care and management of the flock. Comfortable birds are more likely to be able to fend off disease than stressed birds. Birds are comfortable and they live low-stress lives when they have good food, clean water, they're not constantly worried about predators, and they have a safe, darkened place to sleep at night. If something should get through your defenses and your good care, and you see signs of illness in a flock, there are several places that you can go for help. Tassine, your laboratory is an important resource for flock keepers that run into flock health problems. What are the options for getting help for sick chickens? Well, I want to mention one thing. Please, if you start to lose birds in the flock, if you start to have death losses in your flock, please don't wait. It's very important to get diagnosis. Uh, early diagnosis will minimize the death losses, and as we mentioned before, some diseases are treatable. So when you start to lose one bird today, another bird tomorrow, please don't wait until you lose 50% of the flock. Try to act very quickly, and you have several options to, correct, to get a correct diagnosis. You may contact uh, a veterinarian with experience, uh, or interest in poultry, that's the first option. The other option is really to contact the veterinary diagnostic lab in your state. And these diagnostic lab, usually they can do additional laboratory testing to confirm the diagnosis of disease. And I must, we mentioned before that in many cases that symptoms are similar, they are not specific. So additional laboratory tests are really important to confirm the diagnosis of certain diseases and the veterinary diagnostic laboratory in, in your state uh, can do that for you. When you have high mortality, if the mortality is alarming, like you lose many birds in the flock, especially within a short period of time, it is very important to alarm the authorities in your state, the veterinarian, state veterinarian uh, in your state about this because this could be uh, dealing with a, a contagious disease and the early we act, the likely we can contain the disease from spreading to other birds. Uh, the other options you may have is to contact county 
or university uh, cooperative extension service, which they can also help you with that. Thank you, Dr. Martin and Dr. Aziz. I'll conclude our presentation with an overview of the resources available through USDA APHIS that will help you practice good biosecurity. APHIS Veterinary Services has developed a library of checklists that provide practical tips and recommendations. We encourage you to visit the Defend the Flock website to view and download these materials. All of the checklists are available in multiple languages, including Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Tagalog. We encourage you to visit the Defend the Flock website where you'll find lots of other free tools, including recordings of prior webinars, newsletters, videos, and other resources. APHIS has also created social media content to help promote biosecurity. Infographics covering many of the best practices that we've covered here today are available in English and Spanish. We hope that you will share these with fellow poultry keepers on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and other social media channels to make sure everyone is using biosecurity every day, every time, no matter the size of your flock. Be sure to check out more helpful information on our social media channels. This presentation, along with the answers to your questions, will be available for download from the Defend the Flock website shortly. Be sure to follow Defend the Flock on Facebook and Twitter to be notified when the presentation is available. And use the hashtag Defend the Flock when sharing or posting information to help spread the word. Before we go, on behalf of APHIS, Thank you, Dr. Tafina Aziz and Dr. Michael Martin, for sharing your valuable insights and knowledge with us today. Thank you all for joining us on this webinar. Let's keep our poultry healthy together.